All right. Well, thank you guys all for coming out. I hope you're here to, to hear about some embedded Linux build systems. If you're not, uh, you're in the wrong room. Or maybe I am. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, I do appreciate everybody coming out. I know there's a lot of uh, lo a lot of crossover, a lot of interesting talks here, and uh, I do appreciate you guys coming to hear what I uh, may have to say, either rightly or wrongly, about these uh, these things. So, uh, as I said, we're here to talk about some uh, embedded Linux build systems and uh, distros and uh, various options for uh, getting software up and running on an embedded Linux device. Uh, things have changed quite a bit in the last few years in this space, especially uh, due to systems like the Raspberry Pi, making it a lot easier to get in and get started for uh, low effort and low dollars. So there's a lot more options out there than there used to be. So just a, uh, I'll start with just a brief overview of what we're going to discuss here. Whoa, oh. Go away. There we go. Are we back online out there? Sweet. All right. So I want to start with just a little bit of the uh, challenges of embedded Linux. I suspect uh, the majority of the folks uh, in this audience are well familiar with them, but I uh, figured it was worth a review of you know, some of the things we face as embedded Linux developers that are different than your, your traditional desktop or web developer uh, in the issues that they, they will be facing. Uh, define what a build system is from my perspective and uh, just some criteria for evaluating them for use in your particular system design. Uh, discuss a few popular options. Uh, obviously, I'm sure we all have our own favorites here. In my current role, I'm actually kind of stepping back and uh, talking to more customers and seeing a lot more questions about uh, systems I knew nothing about. So ultimately, this talk was really to give me an opportunity to learn about some of these build systems, and I figured I'd share uh, what I learned uh, with uh, as many people as possible. Ultimately, the goal is to help new embedded Linux developers get started. I'm not here to teach you guys how to use Yocto or how to use BuildRoot or how to be an expert in any of these systems. Obviously, in a 45-minute talk, that's uh, quite, a, quite, quite a tall task, um, especially if I'm going to be talking about more than one of the systems. My goal really here is to give a beginner's view of some of these systems and, uh, like I say, things you might want to consider when you're designing your system and deciding what, what build system you want to use for any new upcoming designs you may have. So just uh, briefly about me, uh, my name is Drew Mosley. I'm currently working on a project called Mender.io. We do have a booth over in the, the uh, sponsor area. It's an over-the-air updater for embedded Linux. Uh, it's an all open source, dual AB root file system, full robustness, that kind of thing. Uh, I've been in the embedded Linux and Yocto space for about 10 years, and uh, I've been in general embedded for even longer than that. Uh, as I said, my current role is a uh, technical solutions architect, so I'm out, actually out talking to customers, figuring out what they want to do. Uh, I have a long history of working on the Octo project, but in my current role, I do get uh, people asking about other systems, so th thus the impetus for this talk to kind of figure out some of the, 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 the new systems that are, or rather the other systems, not necessarily new systems, but uh, new to me systems that are out there and when they might be useful and uh, how I can make rec better recommendations to our potential users. So briefly, let's talk about some of the challenges embedded Linux developers face. Obviously, the variety of hardware that we have to deal with is uh, quite a bit broader than most folks. Uh, you know, if you're doing web development software, you're pretty much isolated from the hardware. Uh, you're worried about software APIs and that kind of thing. But uh, in the embedded Linux space, your, your, the variety of hardware you will deal with on any given project can, can change quite a bit from previous projects. Storage media is uh, tends to be a pretty a uh, big issue for, for most of uh, our users. Some systems have SDMMC, some systems have uh, USB mass storage, some systems have uh, UBI, so, and each of those has their own challenges and, and ways of dealing with them. So uh, embedded Linux developers typically have to deal with those, uh, those kind of things. Uh, additionally, a lot of the drivers and board support packages for the various pieces of hardware we're using in the embedded space may not be in the main line. They may be developed in their own forks, maintained by the, the semiconductor vendors or various other or places like that. So gathering all the right components for any particular platform can be a challenge. And uh, for those coming from the non-embedded world, cross-development uh, kind of takes uh, 
some getting used to. The idea of you know developing code on one machine, running it on another, having to have some kind of connection to the machine, that kind of thing. That 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 does present some challenges for folks moving into the space. And as I said, we do uh, with a lot of the customers we're seeing now, we are getting a lot of uh, new embedded Linux users coming into the space, say from the Node.js communities and that kind of thing, doing IoT devices. Uh, so a lot of these things are very relevant to, to folks that are new to this space. And the initial device provisioning, and what I mean by that is how do you get that initial image on the, on the device? That can be tricky. Every device is different. Some of them are simple. If you're lucky, it's an SD card you can take out, plug it in another machine. Uh, and, and write uh, the image to the SD card. Uh, if you have a uh, raw flash based device, there may be some kind of, you know, you gotta, you gotta short two pins together to put it into a certain mode. So those are all gonna be very device specific and those, uh, those kind of things do, do, do tend to slow down uh, your getting started in, the, in this space. So just a few facts. Uh, embedded Linux systems are very large. In case you were unaware, there are typically in any of these systems anywhere from hundreds of thousands of packages that you'll need to download, configure, build, and, and get up and running on your system. Uh, dependency hell, unfortunately, really is a thing. I actually Googled it, and it's, uh, it's a very big meme. Uh, <laughs> there's lots of uh, interesting photos. I, didn't, I decided not to uh, actually include any of them there, but uh, getting the right combination of packages and versions for any particular configuration can be tricky. Uh, I actually at one point worked on an embedded Linux project where the entire build system was, I think it was like a 10,000 line make file and a 15,000 line shell script. So uh, the, those kind of things don't scale very well. So uh, the, the, again, we're, we're talking about embedded Linux systems. Working with uh, simple make files just doesn't cut it anymore. There's a, there's a number of good options to help you get started without having to deal with a lot of this complexity yourself. Uh, in general, these builds take a long time and take a lot of resources. Uh, if you've ever tried to build, especially something like Qt, uh, cross-build that for uh, an embedded device of some kind, it gets, uh, it gets hairy. It takes a lot of disk space, takes a lot of build time, you know, a lot of coffee breaks while you're waiting for things to finish. Uh, well, we, sure, we can do that too. <laughs> Sword fighting breaks, coffee breaks, whatever. Overnight breaks, you know, I can't tell you how many times I start the builds and go to bed because it's just not worth waiting for, uh, especially when you're building from scratch in some of these cases. Um, uh, some other things to consider, in general, when you're talking about uh, embedded applications and use of these systems in, embedded, in the embedded space, they do require significant customization. Uh, it's rare that you're going to take a system and use it completely out of the box and have it have everything you need for your particular application. You're going to need the ability to customize these systems. And so any of these build systems that you look at, they're going to have to provide some means for you to customize these systems as you move forward in your design. Uh, and similarly, m a lot of the systems will provide defaults, and some of the systems make it more difficult to change those defaults, which may not be appropriate for your environment. So that's another thing to consider, is how well your requirements map into the defaults of whatever build system you have chosen. So what exactly do I mean when I, I'm talking about a build system? So what a build system is, it's a mechanism to specify and build a full embedded Linux system. So it gives you the ability to define your hardware, whichever hardware platform you're working on, whichever SOC you might be uh, have on your board, that kind of thing. Gives you the ability to integrate user space applications, either yours or someone else's. Generally speaking, most of these build systems, they will bring in a lot of uh, user space applications just pulled down directly from their canonical upstream location, and then it, they will all also give you the ability to include your own custom applications and, and scripting and that kind of thing. A uh, couple, of, couple of the things that are part of a build system, ideally you've got the ability to reproduce your build. Uh, a lot of times you see people, especially in the hobbyist maker space, they, they'll log into the system remotely, they'll install the packages using apt-get or, or yum or whatever, and then they'll actually, once they get the system the way they want it, they'll actually copy the system off as a binary, and that's their means of reproducibility. And that's fine for certain environments, but uh, I don't recommend it if you're going to try to go into production and get people to pay you for devices, and uh, you're gonna be deploying large number, numbers of devices. So you need to take a look at your build system and figure out, okay, how am I gonna reproduce this build? How am I gonna make the same build and know exactly what what's getting installed on my devices every time. Uh, they also need to have some support for multiple developers. Again, if you install on an SD card, 
log into the system remotely and try to configure all your files in slash Etsy and install all your additional packages, that doesn't scale real well as your development team scales up. So you need some means of doing the de development away from the board so that you can have your, your larger development teams contribute. Ideally, they allow for parallel processing. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, these systems are huge. The builds take forever. Uh, you've got to be able to do uh, uh, builds in parallel as much as possible. Uh, cross tool chains generally should be considered part of your build system. Uh, if you've ever tried to build a tool chain yourself, you'll, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, the number of additional requirements that that brings in, getting all the components matched up. So uh, there are tools that can help with that, and I've got a link for one or two of them later in the slides, but ideally the build system you choose will, will take care of the, the tool chain development for you. And another big thing that a lot of people miss, especially early on, is license management. If you're just doing a, a hobbyist pro uh, project at home, that's usually not a big deal, but if you're working, say, in the automotive space, I know they have some very strict requirements as far as uh, licenses that, that they allow in their code. So ideally, whatever system you choose to develop your, your binary image for your target will give you some ability to track the license that, licenses that are involved and be able to exclude and include specific licenses and throw errors if you try to include the wrong thing. So real briefly, a couple things that typically people think about when they're thinking about build system, but uh, from my perspective, I don't consider that, that these components are part of a build system. It's not an IDE. These, these build systems that we're discussing today are not really uh, built for iterative development. Most of the development, say if you're doing kernel porting or whatever, you're not going to be doing your, your hardcore kernel development within the Yocto build system or the build root system. The, the, the turnaround time is just too long to, to go from a source code change to binaries that actually run on your target. So you might use one of these build systems to provision the system initially, but then you'll typically go for, for your actual application development, you'll do some work outside of it in whatever mechanism is appropriate for you, ideally using the, the tool chains that are built by the, by the distribution and the libraries and that kind of thing. It's also not generally considered a distribution, although the Raspbian view of the world is kind of changing that uh, in, in some of the uh, hobbyist spaces. Uh, a lot of them are using things like Raspbian and Debian directly out of the box. Uh, but uh, distribution is generally something that's uh, kind of layered on top of some of the build systems, although uh, more and more customers and users are looking to use things like standard desktop distributions in, the, in their target devices. It's also not typically a deployment and provisioning tool. So the, 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 the output of these build systems is generally a build image of some kind, but they generally don't include direct mechanisms to deploy to the system. There's just too many variety of ways that you actually have to get the images deployed to your system. As I mentioned earlier, you might, if you're lucky, you've got an SD card that makes it simple. If you're using something with raw flash, there's generally some kind of USB interface where it comes back into your system and shows up as a block device on your development system. So uh, they provide, typically these systems will provide tools to assist in this, but uh, generally speaking, you're going to have to go back to the manufacturer or the board uh, to figure out exactly how to get the images from your build system into your deployed devices. And generally, they're not considered out-of-the-box solutions. It's, most of these, you're not going to take, run a build, install it, and have it have everything you want on it. If you do, great. You're, 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 you're uh, ahead of the game. But generally speaking, you're going to want to customize these things quite a bit. Uh, you'll add your own custom code. You'll add your own custom drivers, that kind of thing. So let's jump into a couple of the, the, the big names uh, in the space. Yocto Project, uh, I suspect most of you have at least heard of it. If you haven't, they've got a, a booth over in the sponsor showcase. Uh, I encourage you to take a look. As I said at the beginning, I've spent quite a few years in, in the Yocto space, so this is the one system that I actually know, know the best. Um, you can see the quote at the very top. Uh, that comes directly from the Yocto Project website. It's not an embedded Linux distribution. It, it creates a custom one for you. So uh, the way Yocto is structured, it's con it consists of recipes, metadata, dependencies, and configuration. Recipes are basically just that. They're sets of instructions that tell the Yocto build system how to, how to download, build, compose, and, and, and everything else you need to do for all the, package, the packages that go into your build system. Uh, the primary output of a Yocto build is a package feed, and what that means is a directory somewhere on your disk with a list of, with, with all the packages that are built as part of your configuration. Typically that'll be in RPM format or uh, Debian format or IPK format. Um, and then the secondary output is the actual boot images. 
So you, with Yocto, you can actually install the, the package management utilities directly onto the target and still do things like uh, installing packages dynamically at runtime using apt-get or uh, IPK or things like that. Uh, it, it does generally build all the components from source, although when you're working with some of the, say, the semiconductor manufacturers, sometimes there are binary blobs that need to get downloaded for uh, various components in the GPU and that kind of thing. Um, and its, it's focus really is more mechanism than policy. There are defaults in the Octo system. Uh, for instance, I believe right now the Octo uh, default is to use SysV in it. Uh, I know System D is becoming more widely used. It wouldn't surprise me if that if their default changes over time. However, the Octo project is generally pretty good about allowing you to substitute your own policy on top of the bare mechanisms that are provided by the Octo system. So you got a list of the products there from a, a standard Yocto build. Uh, it's a root file system image of some kind. It'll be an ext3 or 4 image, perhaps. Uh, it could be a tarball if you want to deploy your root file system over NFS. It could be a UBI image. It just all depends on your board configuration and, and, and how you want to use the files. The kernel, the bootloader, and the tool chain are, are obviously all included as well. Those are typically stored outside of the root file system image, although for some of the deployment models, uh, for instance, the kernel and the device tree could potentially actually be inside the root file system image and loaded from the bootloader there. Uh, and as I mentioned, the package feed, uh, that's, a, that's the, the, the primary output. Uh, and you see the, the, the link there. If you haven't gone over to the octoproject.org web, website, I encourage you to do so. Go talk to the, the, the folks at the booth. Uh, and there's a, a lot of people with a lot of knowledge about Yocto. So just going into just, a little, just enough detail to kind of give you a flavor here. Uh, one of the strengths of the Octo project is its layering mechanism. That allows individuals that are not directly in the Octo project to produce their own layers with their own custom functionality. So for instance, you've got the, the stock layers from the Octo project that you can download from their GitHub. And then for most platforms, you will actually get an external layer that adds the, the board support for that particular platform. So for instance, if you're looking at, Matt, at the Raspberry Pi platform and you want to run Yocto on that, if you go to yoctoproject.org and download directly from them, you won't have the kernel and the board support packages necessary. You actually have to go get the Meta Raspberry Pi layer. Advantages of that are it, it, it allows the systems to develop at their own rates. The Octo, the Octo project has their own release cadence. The, the Meta Raspberry Pi layer has its own release cadence, and everything can be maintained separately. It's both, both a blessing and a curse because getting started that first time can be a little tricky if you're not aware of this. Um, and, and the recipes in general in Yocto, they're developed in Python and Bash, so mo I would imagine most of us are, are reasonably familiar. Uh, there, there, there's snippets of code in the recipes when, for instance, if you want to say, create a custom uh, compilation recipe, uh, you know, it's generally done up in Bash or in Python. So it's fairly easy to expand and store your code uh, in a separate layer. I would also encourage you, when you're doing your system design, the first, one of the first steps you need to do if you're using Yocto is to cre create your own custom layer. That's where your customizations will go. Your, you might use the, the upstream images from the Octo project, but you'll want to add certain packages and that kind of thing. You're better off adding those in a custom layer than keeping local patches against the upstream Yocto project. Uh, it just makes it easier for separation. The Yocto project can move forward, and it makes it easier when it's time for you to move to a new version of the project. If your code is completely separated, then, then, then you can have that code develop at its own pace. Uh, the Octo project also has a very integrated SDK mechanism. And the idea with this is that it's easy to separate between your system developers and your application developers. So your system developers are the ones that are running the full bit bake builds, generating the images from scratch, and, and, and producing the actual target binary images. The application developers may not need that level of detail into the system. They're, they're developing applications in whatever language is appropriate. So you actually export an SDK from the system developer, and that consists essentially of the library's header files and that kind of thing that the application developers will need to link their applications with to, to be able to work with a smaller subset of the system. Uh, and this is, uh, as I mentioned, is, is one of the easy mechanisms for uh, allowing multiple developers to contribute. Uh, some optimizations that the Yocto project provides. Uh, if, if you've done a build previously, 
Uh, the pre-built binaries will, will be stored in a, a mechanism called the shared state cache, which allows for reuse of those binaries if the components going in to generate them have not changed in subsequent builds. So it, it, it really gives you uh, the ability to reuse these components that, that haven't changed from build to build. Uh, and, and parallel builds uh, are very well integrated into the Yocto build system. So uh, the, the, the Yocto build system will take as many cores and as much memory as you can throw at it, and, and it will uh, parallelize as much as possible. Um, a previous talk I saw from ELC, I think about a year and a half, two years ago, estimated there were about 8,400 software packages available as uh, documented in the, the uh, Yocto metadata index. That doesn't include layers that are not necessarily indexed by uh, the Yocto project, so getting an exact number is, is hard to pin down. In that 8400, there's probably quite a bit of overlap with different versions of you know, the cool compilers and QT and things like that. But uh, just to give you an idea, uh, at, at one point it was you know, somewhere around eight to, to 9,000 packages available. So, what I've got on the screen here is uh, the minimum set of steps to get up and running with a Yocto project build. What this will do, obviously, it'll, it'll check out the Rocco version uh, of the, the, the current Yocto project. Within that uh, Pocky repository, there's some uh, emulated platforms and I believe a BeagleBone platform and maybe one or two other platforms that have the platform support in that layer. So th this set of instructions here will actually build an x86 emulated platform with the minimal image, the core image minimal you see there is one of the image recipes provided by the, the uh, Pocky res the repository there. And it, it also provides the scripting to actually easily run that uh, emulated platform on your build system. So in this case, you see the, the, the image here that actually shows uh, the, the, the Octo system booted up to the to shell prompt. At this point, it, you know, it's obviously emulated. You're going to want to expand out from there. But, you know, with this set of four commands, you can actually get a Yocto system up and running uh, to start nosing around with it and get a, get a feel for how, how this system might be useful in your next design. So just in, in summary about Yocto, it is very widely supported by uh, board and semiconductor vendors. A lot of the manufacturers out there actually maintain their own layers. Uh, with the board support for their particular platforms. So uh, if you are on a particular platform, you, de you, you definitely want to check what is provided by your manufacturer. It has an extremely active developer community. The mailing lists get a uh, significant amount of traffic. I know there's an active IRC channel, pretty, pretty standard open source uh, community uh, model. Uh, wide, lots of functionality uh, enabled by that layering mechanism. There's a lot of... Uh, Platforms that can be added outside of the main community. There's a lot of functionality, application layer things that can be added outside of the main community. So that uh, that allows for a very uh, widely diverse uh, set of functionality. And it's extremely customizable and expandable. And one of the nice things about it is, uh, generally speaking, they try to avoid putting too many requirements on your, your host system. So where possible, the Octo project will actually build appropriate versions of the native tooling that are required for, for that build, which, is, uh, uh, which allows it to easily be supported on a wider variety of host operating systems. A um, couple of downsides, it does in general have a steep learning curve. It's easy to get started quickly, but to be functional and, and, and understand all the ins and outs, especially when you're adding additional layers, it can take a while uh, to get used to that. Uh, it's an unfamiliar environment and to non-embedded developers, and that's really true of all these systems we're discussing today. Um, and generally speaking, it, it's pretty resource intensive, especially the first time you try to do a build for a new system. If you're putting a lot of uh, target code on the target, it, the initial build times can be uh, pretty significant, and the uh, amount of disk can be pretty significant as well. Um, the the uh, mitigation for that, of course, is that shared state mechanism that I mentioned. Uh, and if you have a central build system, of course, uh, you can actually pull from that shared state uh, from, your cent uh, from your CI system to any of your developer build systems. So there's a lot of mitigations to this, but uh, those are some things to be aware of. So moving on, build root is probably the other, the, the, the next biggest one that uh, you'll see around here. I know they, the fact they got stickers up here, I guess somebody left it here uh, when they were giving a talk the other day. You see the quote uh, across the top, again, that was uh, pulled directly from their website. Uh, the primary output of build root is boot images. Uh, they, they don't generally support the RPM style package management, although things are changing uh, all the time. So it's possible that has uh, changed since uh, the last time I dug deeply into it. I know I've already received at least one email uh, correcting a couple things I had in here earlier. So um, it's because it doesn't generally consider 
packages outside of the boot images that you're that you're building. It's uh, sometimes referred to as a firmware generator, uh, just to kind of give you a, an idea of how it's used as opposed to something like Yocto, which is uh, providing a little bit uh, more functionality at the, the package level. Again, similar to Yocto, it builds all the components from source, and the focus really is on simplicity. And I, I'm, I'm new to build root, but I was actually able to get systems up and running pretty simply. Uh, so the, the focus on simplicity really is, is an advantage if, in terms of the speed of getting started. The main products, of course, are the root file system image uh, and the kernel bootloader and toolchain. Very similar to Yocto. You're going to have very, you know, it, it's trying to do a lot of the same things. So obviously, the the products that uh, that you're going to get out of the build system are going to be very similar. Some of the details it uses the uh, make files and kconfig. Uh, obviously, that's very widely supported, well known. If you've ever done any work in uh, BusyBox or, or in uh, U-Boot or in the kernel, uh, you've seen uh, screenshots like the one on the on the slide here. Uh, by default, they they the default images are intended to be very small. Where possible, configuration options are disabled in the, in the default configuration. So if you just come in and run one of the standard def configs, most of the, most of the configuration options for the various packages that are built as part of the build will have been disabled by default. They do have a BR2 external mechanism, and that's, uh, it's similar in functionality to the layering mechanism in Yocto. It's a, a way for you to store uh, your local additions outside of the main build root source tree. However, uh, unless things have changed, it's really one place to store it. So I, I can't store a layer and then have someone else store a layer and be able to pull them all in. It, it's, there's the build root main sources, and then there's the BR2 external sources, which would be my local configurations and customizations. Um, as I mentioned, in this case, recipes are typically defined uh, in the kconfig and make uh, syntax, so it's uh, fairly fil familiar for, I'm sure, a lot of us, and there's lots of documentation out of it. They did recently add an SDK mechanism similar to what the Yocto project has where uh, the application and system developers are able to work in different environments that are more appropriate to them. And uh, a previous ELC, ELC talk estimated about 1,800 software packages. Again, that number is probably low now, uh, but uh, since there are things that are generally not included, like the on-target tool chains, the number, total number of packages that are available for BuildRooter are, are, is going to be typically lower than you will see in the Yocto project. So similar to the slide I had for uh, Yocto, here's our, here's our getting started for build root. It's just a, a couple of commands. This uh, pulls the latest version, the 2018.02 version directly out of their Git tree, uh, runs a, uh, a, a, an emulated def config, and, uh, and, and launches it. In this case, it actually launches two windows. One is the frame buffer window, and one is just the serial console window. But uh, in a similar number of commands, you can get an emulated platform up and running uh, that, that will let you uh, get started and play, play a little bit with BuildRoot. So, summary, uh, and I, I put the first bullet in both the pros and cons. There seems to be less corporate involvement with BuildRoot than uh, with Yocto. That may just be the bias of uh, the, the, the users and, and people that I talk with, but uh, that can either be a pro or a con depending on, uh, on your point of view. So I've listed it in both places, and I'll let you pick which side makes sense uh, for, for, for the way you feel about things. It is very quick to get started. That's the, the, one of the primary, uh, primary design goals, and it's easy to understand. Uh, with, it does have an active development community and, and fairly broad architecture and board support, and I know they're expanding all the time. Um, configuration changes, if you're trying to switch from one board to another, generally that's going to require a full rebuild. They don't have quite the number of places for um, storing configuration information that they do in Yocto. So typically, if you have, for instance, two, uh, you want to run the same basic image on two different platforms, there's some manual syncing to make sure you get the same def config between those two platforms. So with Yocto, it's, it's separated out a little bit more. You can kind of pull from different areas. With uh, BuildRoot, it's, it's a little bit more manual if you are building multiple platforms and want the same, uh, the sa the same basic configuration. There doesn't appear to be any reusable shared state by default, but there, there are some settings in the kconfig that seem to enable that. I haven't had a chance to play with it. Uh, I see some faces around here that probably know a lot more, more about that than I do and uh, can certainly uh, speak to that uh, if there are questions about it. So moving on, OpenWRT. Uh, you see the quote at the top from them. It's a fully writable file system with package management. 
Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it, it basically started as replacement firmware for the venerable Linksys WRT54G router. Uh, that, that router has been around for I don't know how many years now and uh, is uh, no longer being maintained, obviously, by the manufacturer. Uh, people wanted to continue using it, so they started developing their own custom firmware. Uh, its primary focus of this, of this system is, is on networking. Uh, the, the number of devices that they have custom firmware for is uh, pretty astounding. I didn't realize there were that many consumer networking devices out there, but there's quite a few if you scroll through their list of devices. Um, Unlike BuildRoot and Yocto, OpenWRT seems to be, to be primarily fo focused on the binary distribution side. They do have a build system, but it's very much, if you go to openwrt.org, the focus there is really on downloading the binaries and deploying them to your system. So they provide pre-built binaries for a number of systems, uh, and, and uh, expandability is provided in OpenWRT through uh, on-device package management, very similar to what you would see in a desktop type uh, distribution. The products of an OpenWRT system are the firmware image, uh, typically in a device-specific format. I have seen some of the maker boards coming out uh, where the default operating system for them is, is an OpenWRT. So I, I know they're, they're definitely adding functionality. Um, but also, generally speaking, for a number of the consumer boards that they provide images for, there are package repositories available that you could actually download directly to uh, over the internet. So if you install OpenWRT, for instance, on an old router you, you happen to have at home, the package repositories are there if you want to install something like OpenVPN or some of the other packages that are not in installed by default. So as I mentioned, there is a build system. Unfortunately, I didn't get a whole lot of time to play with it. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, areas where my content is a bit uh, thin here. So if anybody has any experience with it, I'll be over at my booth uh, all day today and tomorrow. I'd love to, to pick your brain about it. Uh, I know it consists of make files and patches. It feels very similar to build root in that, in that respect. Uh, it does obviously generate a cross tool chain, root file system image, uses kconfig. There's a link for it there. Uh, it, as I said, it does very. It, its goal is to do very similar work to what both BuildRoot and Yocto do. So I would imagine uh, it's going to ultimately look very, very familiar to anyone that's familiar with any of the other systems. So just a summary on OpenWRT. It is a it is a great choice as replacement firmware if you happen to have a consumer device at home that uh, may no longer be supported by the manufacturer, but uh, you don't want to necessarily put it in the garbage. Go check out their website. They may have a pre-built binary image that uh, is maintained and, and has uh, quite a bit newer code than, than what you have on the device from the manufacturer. It is a good choice for any kind of router networking device. Uh, I have had, uh, in my role, uh, customer facing now, we, we do have folks ask about OpenWRT, typically for router devices and that kind of thing. And if your application does require package-based updates, this is uh, potentially a good choice for you as well. Uh, some potential cons, it seems less fe flexible for general embedded applications, although I'm willing to be convinced otherwise on that. Uh, th as I said, this is uh, the one that I'm uh, just starting to dig into. Um, and it seems to be, have a, a bit more policy imposed by the OpenWRT design. They don't make, it doesn't seem that you can easily customize it as much as you can with, uh, with the other options we've discussed. And if you are using package-based updates with a large device fleet, that can, that can lead to problems down the road just due to version, uh, version explosion. If you don't know exactly what's on, say, you know, you have a fleet of 10 to 15,000 devices, it can be a little bit difficult if they're all updating at the package level on their own schedule. So package-based updates, you might want to rethink that uh, depending on, on your use case. But uh, again, that's going to be very specific uh, to your particular application. So. Moving on, as I mentioned, the uh, desktop distributions have seen kind of a, a, a more use in the desktop space lately. So, you know, why can't I use my favorite distro in the embedded space? And the answer really is that you can, with some caveats. Um, if you've used a, a Raspberry Pi, uh, they come with a, a Debian variant on it uh, by default. Uh, the, the BeagleBone comes with, I believe, it's Debian by default. So certainly these packages are out there. Um, the, the basic workflow is you take the installer from the whatever favorite distro you have uh, and, and you install it on an SD card and you pop the SD card in the device and if you need to add additional packages, you use on-target package management to install the packages, that kind of thing. Uh, it does impose more policy than some of the 
build systems we've discussed in and potentially significant amounts of policy. Uh, each of the distributions has their own set of defaults that may or may not be applicable for, for your particular use case. Uh, and uh, uh, you're dependent on the vendor distro generally for upgrades and the decisions they make as far as what the defaults are going to be, whether they're using Wayland or Xorg or SystemD or SysVNit. So uh, that's definitely something, that, something to consider uh, if you're considering this approach. Most of these device uh, desktop distros, they're not targeted embedded applications, so just in general they may not be the best choice. Uh, they certainly are uh, easy to get started with. Uh, but they're not very cross-development friendly typically. Uh, I've seen a lot of people trying to run the tool chains actually on the devices. And while that works uh, in the short run, I think in the long run it tends to be pretty painful to actually do on-target development for some of these smaller device, device systems. So uh, just some, to, to summarize that, there are a lot of choices to start with. Uh, you saw the, all the uh, uh, images I had on the original slide. There's Debian, Ubuntu, you know, raspy and arts, there's a, there, there's a plenty of uh, choices. Uh, your developers are likely already familiar with many of these systems, so that, that, that definitely helps you get up and st up, up started quickly with that. Uh, typically, there's a large selection of pre-built packages for these things, uh, and it, it's quick and, and easy to get started, and if you need on-target development, that's generally possible with these systems. Uh, the, the, the decisions by the vendor uh, may affect you negatively uh, if they make a decision that you don't like. Usually they'll make, give you some means to undo that, but uh, it may or may not be very easy to do so. Uh, reproducibility is complicated in this environment. Typically, you know, if you're installing packages by hand on the target, it's hard to come up with a means to produce that image from scratch. Uh, On-target images are going to be slow, uh, and then off-target builds uh, may be difficult or impossible especially in the, uh, the ARM space, getting a, a cross tool chain that can build for the particular variant you may happen to have can be difficult. So with that, I'll move into just a, a couple bits of other criteria that you might consider when you're deciding on an a system for putting your embedded Linux system together. Uh, if you have already chosen your hardware and the, the hardware vendor provides support for one or more of the above systems, that may, that may drive your decision for you. Uh, frankly, that's uh, I think probably the case for a lot of systems. Is you just the the, the vendor provides it, and it's uh, the the path of least resistance to 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 start with that. Uh, training and documentation, depending on how familiar your developers may be, uh, all all the systems we discussed today. There's lots of documentation. Uh, some of them have more or less training available, uh, and if you do want to use a commercial vendor to provide your base support, uh, that 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 can also help drive your decision. Uh, and frankly, uh, whatever developer experience or whatever experience your developers may have and preferences they may have for, for build systems to use. So uh, just real quick, I'll mention just a couple of related tools that you may come across in your research uh, if you're new to the space. UC Linux is a port of Linux uh, to systems without a memory management unit. At least that's the way it started. I haven't kept up with it over the years. Uh, according to their website, they're still back at kernel 2.6, but I haven't dug in it uh, too deeply to know. Uh, but they do provide user applications, libraries, and tool chains. So if you're just getting started in the space, that may be something you come across. And also cross tool ng, uh, which is a kconfig based uh, configuration utility for actually generating cross tool chains. So this th this is actually useful uh, if you need to generate tool chains for bare metal, if you need to generate tool chains that, that, that go to various uh, RTOSs in, in, in embedded Linux. So that, that, that can be handy as well if you do have, say, a Debian and you want to get a cross tool chain uh, built up uh, from source for it. So, uh, and, and, and I just wanted to mention a couple others that I came across. Uh, I've got the links here. Uh, I know nothing about them uh, other than what I've seen. Uh, you know, I've, I've used Android on a phone, obviously. I've not had any experience with it in the embedded space, but it's obviously becoming uh, more common there. Uh, ELBE and ESAR, as far as I know, they're both systems around the Debian pre-built packages to allow you to configure a custom system without having to build everything from source. So basically, if I'm understanding them correctly, they actually go pull the binary packages from the Debian package repositories and, and kind of repackage them into the root file system image. So that's a, th those are some other options. There's lots of things going on in this space. Things are changing all the time. Uh, so definitely you know, keep your eye out. Things will change. 
Uh, I'd like to eventually add a little bit of more content on some of those other options to this talk, and uh, you know, maybe at uh, future, uh, future conferences, I'll be able to give a, a little bit more details on some of those other systems. So I just want to, we got just a few minutes left. I, I just want to kind of, these are some use cases that I put together. These are my thoughts. Your mileage may vary. If you're a beginner, hobbyist maker, uh, the commercial debt, and you're using something like a Raspberry Pi that you can get easily, uh, you know, something like a desktop distro might be a good choice. Uh, if you look at uh, some, of the, some of the maker uh, blogs out there, most of them start with Debian and, and, and work from there. Uh, if you're in commercial use with a single configuration, uh, build root might be, is a good option. If you're in a commercial use in multiple configurations, uh, Yocto project uh, might be a, a better choice just because of the way things are structured and allow you to uh, easily layer things on top of each other. Again, there's so many decisions that go into any one, any one uh, application. I don't want to presume to tell you exactly which one is right. There's no right answer for everybody. Uh, these are just some general ideas that I threw together. And I'll kind of leave this slide up there and kind of open it up for questions. This is, again, my, my thoughts on the uh, kind of the matrix of things you might want to consider as you move forward uh, with, with your system design. So with that, I think we've got about 10 minutes uh, for questions. So I will open the floor. Yes. Okay, so the, the, the question is, you know, a lot of these uh, commercial boards today come with uh, ready-made Yocto support provided by the vendor, typically. And is there any easy way to import that information into BuildRoot? Is that basically your question? Yeah. Not that I'm aware of, uh, but uh, that would certainly be nice. I know the recipes are very different, so uh, there, there may be some tools that can help with that, but uh, I doubt there's any, you know, real ex explicit plug-and-play mechanism to just, you know, take the BSP out of Yocto and drop it into BuildRoot. Yes. Would this be uh, seen as kind of almost an extension for like a DevOps kind of thing if you're like deploying things and setting things up for development environments or test environments and building it for you know development kits and having your DevOps team handle those for supporting for people? Yeah, so the question uh, is, you know, how does this plug into DevOps environments and is, is this appropriate for your build systems and, and that kind of thing? And it, it depends on, obviously, on your workflow. Um, at, at, at my current company, we do, you know, our, our CI system uses Yocto builds because that's how we deploy our system by default. Uh, it certainly can plug in easily into things like Jenkins and other uh, other systems like that. So, and I I believe there are actually extensions for Jenkins and various other CI systems to make it easy to do things like this. I I haven't really spent a whole lot of time on that side, uh, but any anything that allows you to you know run a shell script, you can actually run any of the pretty much any of these build systems. Yes. Have I looked at Gen 2? No, I have not. Um, I know, uh, you know, on the desktop side, Gen 2 is a, it's basically a build from scratch uh, desktop operating system, right? Yeah, I have not. Do they have uh, decent uh, support for uh, non-x86 architectures and cross-development and that kind of thing? Okay, great. Well, I'll, I'll add it to the list uh, that'll make this talk even longer. And I know the, the SUSE guys are here, and uh, the fact that they supported uh, ARM was, uh, was news to me. So, as I said, this thing, this is changing on a daily basis, so. Yes. Are you familiar with the mechanism to build like a desktop user land in combination with a custom kernel and like be would be free? Is that something you can do with Yocto? Like if I want to have my own kernel and be like free, but have a good user land, say. Uh, okay, so the question is, how do you get uh, more uh, desktop-style user land with something like a Yocto or a build root, which is a build from source type kit? Well, they all, you know, all those systems will have some level of user space applications, uh, and they can all import other applications. You just have to take the time to write the recipes to do them. Uh, I don't know how many people in the embedded space would want a full uh, Ubuntu GNOME interface on their target device. Uh, there may be a layer for it out there already, because there, 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 there is a lot of uh, a lot of different layers out there that people have used. So it wouldn't surprise me if something like that exists. Yes. Uh, 
Okay, so the question is, uh, are there any web interfaces to the build system? Uh, I'm not, uh, I haven't come across TimeSys in many, in many years, so I can't comment specifically on theirs. I know the Yocto project has a, a, a project called Toaster, which is basically a web front end. Uh, that's the only one I'm familiar with. Uh, I launched it once as part of a previous job, and that's as far as I've gotten with it. But uh, I know it's under active development, so. Uh, so the question is, is there a preference on CPU architecture uh, for, for indi individual build systems? And, and certainly there is. I think they all have a, a you know, ARM x86 uh, MIPS are generally supported across the board. I know BuildRoot has some uh, other uh, more esoteric architectures that, uh, may or, you know, that may or may not have Yocto support. I don't know. Uh, I tend to focus on the more common ones that are supported by everything. So certainly that's one of the first criteria you'll need to look at if you have, you know, something that's not a a commonly used platform, you'll definitely want to investigate which systems may support your, your chipset and your boards. Yes, in the back. Sure, so the point was uh, I don't have a line in here for maintainability, and the idea being if you're using something that has an upstream community like Ubuntu or Debian, uh, you get a lot of uh, maintainability for free. Uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing depends on, on your point of view. Uh, you know, if the software changes out from under you, that may not be a good thing, but uh, certainly if you're pulling from a pre-built binary system like that, the, the, then that does uh, save certainly some uh, effort and, and build time uh, on the part of your developers. All right, anybody else? All right, very good, thank you so much.